invention in World War II fighter design was a low-wing, single-seater monoplane powered by an inline engine. The Messerschmitt, the Spitfire, the P-40, the Yak. And the plane that perhaps represents the highest refinement of this layout is the P-51 Mustang. It was a plane that, far from being a radical design innovation, was very much a homogenization of the conventional wisdom of fighter aircraft into one of the last, and perhaps the greatest, of mass-produced piston-engined fighters. came into being in a roundabout way. The plane was designed to meet a British order as the United Kingdom scrambled almost too late to equip itself for the war that had engulfed Europe. The British wanted to buy the Curtis P-40, but Curtis were flat out keeping up with the demand for their plane and were unable to supply them fast enough for the UK's need. The British Purchasing Commission therefore looked about for someone else to build the Curtis fighters for them. that had already impressed the British greatly was North American Aviation. In 1938, the UK had placed orders with that company for its AT-6 Harvard trainers. The company was a newcomer to aircraft manufacture, having first committed itself to the field in 1934. The Harvard, its first major sales success, was a well-designed conventional plane, and the British were very favourably impressed by it. What had impressed them even more was the quality of its manufacture. The company typified American drive, energy and enthusiasm, and the contracts for the AT-6 were met within deadlines with the highest standards of quality control. North American's approach to mass manufacture, with moving assembly lines and automation wherever possible, streamlined production and allowed for a very high standard of finish. Their planes were built with a minimum of fuss, and though North American may not have been contributing hugely to aviation design at that stage, they were certainly breaking new ground in manufacturing systems. With their high regard for North American aviation's competence and reliability, it's not surprising that the British Purchasing Commission should have approached them to build the P-40 under licence from Curtis. Although North American were willing to comply with the request, they did not have much enthusiasm for building a rival manufacturer's aeroplane, and the president of the company, J.H. Kindleberger, an astute engineer and persuasive salesman, suggested that the company would build an entirely new and better fighter for the British. <laughs> 
He undertook to complete the design and construction of the first plane in the 120 days it would have taken to tool up for production of the P-40. The P-40 was a development of the series of Hawks built by the Curtis Company, based around its successful but underpowered P-36 design, which dated from 1934. The P-40, fitted with an Allison engine that was supercharged for medium altitudes, was best suited to lower level flying. Being based on a tried airframe that was already in production, it offered low cost and early delivery, and simply because of its availability, it had been ordered in large numbers as a stopgap while work went ahead on more advanced designs. Somehow it was to stay in production for most of the war, even though its design was outdated when it was first produced, having been overtaken by the Messerschmitt 109 and the Hurricane and Spitfire and other European designs. Planes with greater manoeuvrability and firepower and with a clearer role as fighters. In November 1939, the British wanted the P-40 for the same reason that the US was buying it. It was the best available American fighter. The Lockheed P-38 was still far from ready and the P-47 was still to take shape, even on the drawing board. So they wanted the P-40. As North American's NA-73X was developed, the British gave every sign of being delighted. Before its first flight, they had placed further orders for the plane, bringing the total to 620. On the 9th of December 1940, they advised North American that, in line with British policy, they had allocated the aircraft a name, Mustang. The prototype had been ready in 102 days, but then waited for its engine, which was 20 days late. Even so, it was completed just two days outside the set 120 days. The team, led by engineer Raymond Rice and designer Edgar Schmoog, had performed a remarkable feat, and the success of the design that they had produced was, in retrospect, to make the achievement almost unbelievable. SAAF had taken two Mustangs for evaluation and, not overly interested, had only placed orders for the plane, given the designation P-51, as part of a Lend-Lease package. These carried four 20mm cannon in place of the earlier version's eight machine guns. After Pearl Harbor, 57 of these were retained by the Air Force. Though the plane had been evaluated as an excellent airframe, fast, manoeuvrable and long-ranged, the limitations placed upon it by its engine had seen it classed as unsuited to escort work, but suited to tactical support and reconnaissance missions. A part of its secret was its use of the then new laminar flow wing, which shifted the thickest part of the wing as far back as was practical to limit drag. had no funding for additional fighters and with the assessment that the impressive new Mustangs were suited to low-level activities they placed an order for 500 of the planes as dive bombers given the designation A-36 Apache. The A-36 stuck to the variant but they were universally known as Mustangs. With the low-level restriction of the Allison engine these were to be the epitome of the mark purposely equipped as tactical support planes aerial artillery. Seen here in desert condition training in the US, the A-36s were to see considerable service. They ended the war with a record of delivering more bombs per sortie than any other USAAF fighter bomber. On the right of this picture you can see the dive brakes, one of the modifications made to the A36 specification. 
The armament had reverted to six wing-mounted machine guns and the plane had wing hardpoints for two 500-pound bombs. Though events were to remould the future of the design, at this stage of its development it was hampered by its engine. The Allison's power died as the plane climbed, leaving it sluggish and unresponsive. Pilots enthused about its performance at low level, where it was speedy and agile. In fly-offs with captured German planes, it had held its own very competently until the altitude soared. Therefore, it was logical to utilize it in low-level missions, which in the main were tactical missions, support of ground troops, photographic reconnaissance, or flying cover on a battlefield. It was a simple step to recast them as dive bombers, and they were effective tactical support aircraft. It was evident that the airframe had many virtues, but the actual plane was a limited thing, and it was given tasks that seemed to fit its limitation. Mustangs were to prove vulnerable. They could be brought down by a very minor hit from any weapon because of their water cooling, radiators and other ducting. The radial engine fighters like the P-47 were better suited to low level work in that they were very hard to bring down with light ground fire. As dive bombers the Mustangs were not a success. The moment when the plane broke its dive left it very vulnerable as a prime target that had advertised its arrival during the dive and was now presenting its most tender aspect. If the Mustang avoided the set piece of the diving attack and simply roared along at low level, its speed protected it from all but the most proficient marksmen. In active service, most of the A36 dive brakes were wired shut and the planes were used in other ways. Here in this early training stage, before the planes were deployed in significant numbers, we can appreciate both the accuracy of the dive bomber and its dangerous exposure. In active service, the A36s and other Allison Mustangs used in low-level missions were powerful weapons. A squadron of Mustangs made a very effective punch as airborne artillery. In addition to the 500 dive bombers, 1,083 of the Allison-powered Mustangs were made, all being best used in low-level roles. machine guns delivered an accurate focused firepower in strafing and the A36 groups were also credited with the perfection of skip bombing, using delayed fuses and dropping the bomb short of the target so that it bounces into position to explode. In some ways, the early Allison-engined Mustangs, including the A36, have been overlooked because of their shortcomings and because of what the design went on to achieve once their vices had been eliminated. However, the worth of the work of the photographic planes should not be belittled, and, as here in India, in several important campaigns of the war, the A36s were critical factors in the successful pursuit of Allied victory. As the Allies fought their bloody way across Burma to open land links with the beleaguered forces in China, 
The nature of the terrain and the lack of any roads or railways saw the troops on the ground become almost totally reliant on the air for supplies and for artillery. There was no way to carry anything bigger than a mortar with them and certainly not a howitzer. But the Mustangs were there. With forward air control direction, the A-36 pilots were able to deliver accurate tactical support and clear obstacles ahead of the troops. Their constant harassment kept the enemy unbalanced and undermined the worth of the continuing establishment of strong points along their lines of retreat. Few airfields became the sites of critical battles in the campaign, and as soon as the troops had established control, engineers were sent in to reopen the field. To fly in tractors and other vehicles, the dangerous and wasteful gliders were used, and runways were hurriedly repaired so that the transport planes could be landed safely. While this footage was being filmed, Japanese troops were still dug in and fighting a fierce rearguard action less than two miles away, and a stream of wounded was constantly arriving at the base for airlifting out with the returning Dakotas. Had the Japanese had any artillery, they would have been able to shell the airfield from their positions. But instead, emergency medical stations could function in the open beside the runways, with only the occasional air raid to threaten procedures. economic might of the Allies and their material resources, the damage from a raid like this figured little in the overall scheme of things. The situation on the ground was far more affected during the monsoons, the wet season. Then, with floods on every river, the losses of supplies were enormous. The road that was being pushed through the jungle in the wake of the advancing infantry became impassable, and the airfields became unmaintainable. During the monsoons, on both sides, things ground to a halt in the mud, in conditions so bad that even the legendary C-47s found themselves unable to operate. To fly planes in these conditions required daring, determination, skill and lots of luck. The Allison engine Mustangs, for all their limitations, were regarded by their pilots with great affection, and so long as they were used within their restrictions, they were very able. They were also a pleasure to fly, responsive and urgent but very controllable and well behaved. Reports on the plane from 1941 on had constantly enthused about its performance when its engine was delivering adequate power. And in retrospect, it seems inevitable that the virtues of the airframe would suggest to someone that the plane be given a better engine. The engine that was eventually suggested in mid-1942 was the Rolls-Royce Merlin, the same engine as the illustrious Spitfire. After trial installations carried out by Rolls-Royce had proved very successful, North American's engineers went to work on the installation and the Mustang underwent some changes in housing the engine in an extremely tight-fitting, streamlined nose, giving the plane overall better lines. The propeller now had four broad blades to turn the power into thrust in the thin air of higher altitudes. 
The carburetor inlet above the engine had been repositioned below the propeller. The fuselage had been strengthened and there had been refinements to the radiator and its ducting. The new plane proved a very different proposition to the earlier models. Where the Allisons had been smooth and silky, the Merlin engined planes were noisy, skittish and needed more attention. However, the returns were overwhelming. At height, it could now outperform anything in the sky. Its top speed had gone from 380 miles an hour to 440, and its rate of climb and reserves of power for emergency manoeuvring had increased. The Mustangs were startlingly improved and ready to re-enter the war as a more important factor. Testing of the new planes, though thorough, was quickly completed. And with a new factory in Dallas adding its output to the Inglewood plant, in 1943 Mustangs were pouring onto the battlefield in great numbers. The output from the two plants were given different numbers, planes from Inglewood being P-51Bs and the identical product from the Dallas plant becoming P-51Cs. The Mustangs had always had large fuel capacity and the combination of this capacity and their miserly demand for fuel, half that of either the P-38 or the P-47, meant that the P-51 had a marked advantage in range. As the British too were to appreciate, Combining this economy with their new power and high-level ability, they were the obvious choice for the role of escort to the massed bombers operating against Germany. The 8th Air Force had been crying out for a plane with the Mustang's capability. And though the first Bs were assigned to tactical groups with the 9th Air Force, the Strategic Command first borrowed them and then swapped them for some of their P-47s to use them as long-range offensive fighters supporting the bombing. had found their element, and with wing tanks providing extra fuel, they roamed the sky over Europe, increasingly not simply supporting the bombers, but seeking combat with the Luftwaffe. As escorts, they were the first effective shield the strategic campaign had enjoyed, and with their guardianship, the danger to the bombers of Luftwaffe attack started to wane. As their numbers increased, there was now no doubt about their role in the European theatre. There was simply no better escort fighter anywhere at the time, and their greater availability was paralleled by an increasing dominance of the air over Europe by the Allied air forces. The Luftwaffe's pilots were used to enjoying at least parity with the opposing fighters, if not overwhelming advantages. Against the Mustang, they were not matched, but bettered. From bases throughout Europe, the Mustangs held increasing sway over the air war. One of the units flying the Mustang was the all-Negro 322nd Fighter Group, which operated from Italy and was involved in several of the war's most famous missions, including the attacks on the Romanian oil fields around Plersti. Working in fairly basic conditions from temporary fields, Groups like these put in their contribution with dedication and effectiveness. For the pilots, being briefed for a mission, there must have been some comfort in the superior performance of their plane. And the feelings of the bomber crews, who had previously flown into the teeth of the German defences unaccompanied, can well be imagined. Still, on any mission, there was a real chance for each pilot that he would be killed or maimed in the coming hours.
Mustangs on the campaign in Germany is reflected in the comment of Goering at Nuremberg that when he looked into the skies over Berlin and saw Allied fighters shepherding the bombers to their deadly work, he knew that Germany had lost the war. The planes he was referring to were Mustangs. The effect of the uprated fighter was to be felt on most of the fronts of the war, as here in China, where they replaced the P-40 and gave Allied air power a cutting edge. Once again, operating from primitive bases, this time at the end of a supply line of almost bizarre complexity, the Mustang's range and power were used to quickly establish air superiority against the outmoded and outclassed enemy equipment. backwater like the China campaign, even a few Mustangs made an immediate impression. They operated beside the tired P-40s of the nationalist Chinese, the planes that had equipped the famous American volunteer squadron, the Flying Tigers. The surviving American pilots, most of them aces, had moved on to sprinkle that very rare and very valuable commodity, experience, through the United States Air Forces, leaving behind the long slogging campaign against the Japanese in China that was to drag on to the war's end. The 356th Fighter Squadron, flying from England, became the home of Major James Howard, one of the Flying Tiger Aces, whose Japanese victories were painted onto his distinctively marked plane upon arrival in Europe. He became famous for his exploits on the 11th of January 1944, when he took on 40 German planes, mostly Messerschmitt 110s, that had managed to mount an attack on a group of B-17s. This, his gun camera footage from that dogfight, shows his targets as he continued to attack the overwhelmingly superior number of enemies until assistance arrived. He was involved in the little battle for 30 minutes and was credited with three definite and three probable victories in the encounter. was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for his action on that day. Among the few criticisms the RAF had made of the Mustang was a dual complaint about the canopy. It didn't allow the pilot to look behind him and a tall pilot was very uncomfortably cramped against the roof of the cockpit. Robert Malcolm was requested to come up with a remedy for these problems and the resulting modification was not only included in production B and C models, but retrofitted to many planes in the field. A single piece bulged hood that slid on runners, it simply and directly approached the concerns as an adaptation of the already existing shape. 
North American's Los Angeles factory was considered to be vulnerable to Japanese bombing, and for much of the war it was cloaked with extensive skirts of camouflage, which not only disguised the buildings, but covered the outdoor run-up lines for the various marks being manufactured at the plant. Under these nets, the Mustangs were rolled out, tuned and tested. The Inglewood netting was to see the arrival of the next Mustang model, the D, with its teardrop canopy that made the Malcolm-designed hood redundant. This later variant of the D, seen on the Inglewood taxiway, includes the extended tail fin that was added to compensate for the loss of side area caused by the redesign. As could have been expected from a company with North American's reputation for manufacturing efficiency, the mass production of the P-51 was carried out in factories that were models of technical refinement. The superb organization and automation of the production lines enabled the delivery of over 9,000 Mustangs during 1944 alone. The company's success with its first fighter, together with its other designs like the B-25 Mitchell bomber, saw it produce more planes during the war than any other American manufacturer. 15,586 Mustangs alone were to be made. Completed, the planes were rolled out of the factory and were towed to the run-up lines to be readied for dispatch to the war. the P-51Ds swarmed into the theatre in large numbers to join the B and C Mustangs that were, to give an indication of their proliferation, already equipping eight groups of the 8th Air Force operating from Britain. They were the critical edge that supported the Allies' drive for air supremacy and maintained that dominance through to the end of the war in Europe. The Luftwaffe continued to throw its resources against the onslaught, in the face of the continued assault on the German cities and the increasing focus of the attacks onto the aviation industry plants and the fuel and transportation systems, the Nazi air arm had no option but to press its defence to the limit. But it costs in pilots and planes that could not be sustained. Though now acknowledged as the Allies' premier escort fighter, the Mustangs retained their old punch as ground attack aircraft and given that they were already deep over enemy territory escorting the bombers, it was logical to set them loose in ground-hugging high-speed attack on transport and Luftwaffe targets as they made their way back to their bases. On the 4th of March 1944, for the first time, Mustangs supported the bombers on the 1100-mile round trip to Berlin. 
This long-range capability of the Mustangs was, from then on, exploited routinely in penetration missions against the tottering Reich. In their activity in the European theatre, the Mustangs flew 213,873 sorties, with 4,950 German planes claimed as shot down and a further 4,131 destroyed on the ground. The aerial victories account for almost half the total claimed by all American units for the European theater in the period after P-51 deployment. On the other side of the ledger, there were 2,520 Mustangs lost in combat, shot down, lost because of mechanical failure, or rarer but still a factor, lost because of pilot error. In this sequence, which we have slowed to quarter speed, the combat cameraman has captured a pilot's mistake and we see the horrific result as two Mustangs on a ground attack sweep collide and plough into the ground. The P-51 outperformed all the piston-engined fighters which the Luftwaffe was able to deploy against it and was untroubled in maintaining its supremacy in the air until the emergence of the German jet and rocket fighters. Even against the ME-262, which Hitler had finally accepted as Germany's remaining trump card, the P-51 scored victories, normally by ambushing the jets at landing and takeoff, or by overwhelming them with sheer weight of numbers in the dogfights around the bomber groups. One to one, the Mustangs were totally mismatched against the jets, which were over 100 miles per hour faster than them. Fortunately for the Allies, the Nazi leadership had lacked the common sense to back the jets in their early development, and they were deployed too late in too small numbers to stalemate the decisive conflict in the air over Germany. Speedier still, but more eccentric and ultimately of far less use than the 262, was the ME-163 Comet rocket plane, popularly known as the Devil's Sled, which could reach nearly 600 miles per hour. The rockets were deployed at too early a stage of development and were extremely difficult and dangerous planes to fly. They could carry only limited fuel and spent a large part of each flight unpowered, gliding back to base. before it ran out of thrust. For the pilots, taking off on a jettisonable trolley and then landing without power on a skid, the little rockets were a very demanding proposition. In addition, in its glide phase, it was susceptible to attack from the Allied fighters and unable to defend itself or take evasive action. In the war's other major strategic bombing campaign against Japan, the Mustangs again were the first US Air Force fighters over the enemy homeland. The Japanese Air Force had already been effectively destroyed in the far-flung battlefields of Asia and the Pacific, its pilots wiped out and its designs, aging but still in production, totally outclassed by the newer and more powerful American planes. The heyday of the Zeros in the early clashes had been brief, and as the US carriers and Air Force groups received the new marks, the Japanese had quickly lost their ascendancy in the air. With the Mustangs loose from Iwo Jima, there was no destination outside the reach of fully fighter-protected US bomber groups. Within weeks of the 19th of February landings on Iwo Jima, on the 6th of March 1945, strips had been prepared and the Mustangs of the 15th Fighter Group had taken up residence. They were joined on the 15th by the 21st Group, 
On the 7th of April, they mounted their first major sweep of the Japanese homeland, when the six squadrons of P-51s escorted B-29s to Nakajima, near Tokyo. The Japanese lost 21 aircraft in attacking the formation and succeeded in downing only two Mustangs. No B-29s were affected by the Japanese planes. This set the pattern for what was to follow. A further group was deployed in late April, and by the 22nd of June, the three groups had flown 832 missions. The B-29s were flying from the Marianas and had further to go than the P-51s. But even so, the round trip for the fighter pilot was a major endurance test. The flights, which were the longest regular escort missions of the war, lasted nearly eight hours and were mostly over water. For the first two hours of the flight, the pilots had another problem in that the fuel tank added inside the fuselage affected directional stability in flight and until that tank had been emptied, the pilot needed even more than usual strength and attention to control the plane. The next fuel priority was to get the most out of the drop tanks before they were jettisoned to clear the airframe for action. to the coldly remote and impersonal attack of the airmen. The Japanese population, surrounded by the increasingly unrecognizable wrecks of their cities and bombarded by leaflets outlining the forthcoming attacks, were engulfed in a sense of terror, of inevitable fiery death from the bombers. For the Japanese airmen, simply taking off became an act of bravery. In the event of combat, they would be confronted by better trained pilots flying far superior aircraft in greater numbers, wielding heavier batteries of guns. Their planes were swatted from the sky with inevitability. On the ground, they were left to the hammering violent savagery of the slashing runs of the Mustangs that roamed tormentingly at treetop height. The Japanese Air Force could not defend itself, let alone Japan. months of the war are a testimony to the stubbornness and pride of the Japanese government. The immense bloodshed and destruction wrought in Japan was without sense or need. A more pragmatic regime would have accepted its fate. Doubtless the Mustang pilots, returning cramped and exhausted to Iwo Jima, would have preferred to have been able to go home. Then with the atomic attacks, the Japanese finally collapsed and it was over. The P-51s flew their last missions on the 14th of August, the day that Hirohito finally announced acceptance of the Allies' conditions. After the war, the Mustangs continued in use, not only with the Air National Guard, but in active service. Those retained were the Ds and the later long-range H models, with the development of US jets, it was obviously only a matter of time before they would be replaced, having already been superseded. Not only in the US, but around the world, the 51 stayed in service, equipping the air forces of many countries. <laughs> 
memories from the World War to immediately fade from use. A week after the North Korean army crossed the border into South Korea, the first Mustangs were in action there. Australian fighters based in Japan, escorting a B-29 raid on the 2nd of July 1950. For the newly reorganized United States Air Force, retention of the Mustangs as a stopgap while jets were developed and manufactured in large numbers meant that they were still available when war broke out in Korea. A number of Mustangs, now called F-51s, were transferred back from the National Guard to active service and in the first year of the war they flew more combat missions than any other Air Force type. Despite relatively heavy losses, they were used because they were the only aircraft available in large numbers that had both the long range required and the ability to carry enough payload to do some damage when they arrived at a target. Here, as part of the preparation for a mission, the gun camera, mounted in the front of the wheel bay, receives a new reel of film. Usually laden with bombs and rockets, they served as ground support, flying over inhospitable mountainous terrain which offered little chance of successful forced landing. And the old vulnerability of liquid-cooled engines to ground fire was re-exhibited. As an example, the South African squadron which flew Mustangs in Korea from November 1950 to January 1953 lost nearly 60 to ground fire. But to round out the picture, it must be added that the unit, despite the cost, was effective and very valuable, flying 10,373 Mustang missions in Korea. The Mustang, outdated and deployed in a mission that made them vulnerable, still was a weapon of great destructive power. Against the MiG-15, the Mustang was more a target than an opponent. Its days as the world's premier fighter were behind it. However, in the early phases of the war, it was the sustained ferocity of the Mustang fighter bombers that bought time for the 8th Army to dig in around Pusan and finally halt the tide of the initial rush of the North Korean Army. The inertia of history may have already run down the technology of the piston-engined fighter, but the Mustang represented the highest point of refinement of that lineage, and there were things a Mustang could do that nothing else in the inventory could. But it did them at a price. Back with the National Guard, the planes flew on to the mid-50s in United States use, and a very few stayed with the Air Force for another 20 years as chase planes. The P-51 scattered all over the world, to China, Australia, where the last Mustangs were made, Sweden, almost all the South American republics, the Caribbean, and elsewhere. They formed the backbone of the infant Israeli Air Force and flew in combat with real effect in large numbers for the last time in the 1956 Desert War. They were still frontline planes in air forces like that of the Dominican Republic and Indonesia into the 70s. In addition, they became the plane of choice for many civil flyers, for acrobatics, racing, or simply for pleasure. <laughs> 
pilots still love them. They may have their little vices, like the tugging torque of the propeller that drags at the plane in takeoff, but with their thuggish power coupled to their dependable airframe, they are a totally different breed to other civil planes and retain a mystique that is unmatchable. Examples still flying are maintained with such fanaticism and love that they will probably still be with us into the next century. Attempts to describe any particular plane as the greatest fighter of World War II are admittedly always generalizations and of little value. Certainly one can list a handful of types as the outstanding planes, but to then pick one is asking for an argument. In this program we have repeatedly described the Mustang as the preeminent fighter of its day, despite the well-argued claims of those who back other marks, like the Focke-Wulf 190 or the Spitfire. However, the Mustang stands apart from both in the same crucial way. The Spitfire, like the other European designs, was a short-range fighter, basically defensive. The P-51 was comparable in speed and manoeuvrability to the Spitfire I, and about the same length and height. However, it was roughly twice the weight, which was given over to the fuel it carried, giving it a range that was around three times that of the British plane. This factor makes obvious the point that the Mustang, unlike its comparable European contemporaries, was an offensive fighter. Its part in the strategic campaign in Europe was decisive, and it was not simply, as the German adherents of the FW190 claim, a factor of superior numbers that gave the Mustang its success, it was the better plane. Compare the others to one another. The Mustang stands alone. <laughs> 